I'm presently working on um, a couple of new strategies for defending compatibilism. And um, this evening, I'm going to present one of uh, these strategies, and I, and I thought it might be a good idea to um, briefly outline that strategy before I start with my presentation. So typically, um, incompatibilists argue roughly as follows. Suppose I have to decide, for example, between marrying and not marrying. If determinism is true, my future decision is entailed by the past and the laws, but nobody is able to do anything about the past and nobody is able to do anything about the laws, so it seems that I'm not able to do anything about my future decision. And the strategy that I want to present this evening uh, consists of three steps. Um, as a first step, and this is nothing new, I think um, compatibilists uh, should point out that uh, the argument, as I have stated, is strictly speaking a failure. And for the simple reason, uh, because um, entailment is a relation between propositions and not be between entities such as the past or the laws or my future decision. So strictly speaking, an incompatibilist would have to argue as follows. Um, well, if we let um, P0 be a proposition that describes the past, and if we let L be a proposition that describes the laws, and if we let P be a proposition that describes my future decision, then if determinism is true, um, P is entailed by P0 and L. Nobody is able to do anything about P0, for nobody is able to do anything about a proposition that describes the past. Nobody is able to do anything about L for a parallel reason. So it seems that I'm not able to do anything about my future decision. So here comes the second step of my strategy. I think compatibilists should point out that um, it is not always true that um, nobody is able to do anything about the description of the past. Because there are descriptions of the past that are also, at least in part, about the future. And so um, incompatibilists have to reformulate again their argument, and they have to say, um, well, nobody's able to do anything about P0, for nobody's able to do anything about a proposition that describes only the past. And nobody's able to do anything about L for a similar reason, so it seems I'm not able to do anything about my future decision. And that brings me to the third and last point of my strategy. Compatibilists should argue that P0 is not a proposition that describes only the past. And that's basically what I'm trying to do uh, this evening. I'm trying to construct um, arguments to the conclusion that P0 is not a proposition entirely about the past, or a proposition that describes only the past. So that's the plan uh, for this evening. We are, without doubt, all in debt to Peter van Inwagen. In his groundbreaking book, An Essay on Free Will, as well as in his new collection of essays, Thinking About Free Will, van Inwagen has developed with unparalleled rigor and clarity, a variety of frameworks in which to address the problem of free will and determinism. His work has not only led to a revival of incompatibilism, his work has deeply influenced the way in which all participants of the, de of the debate nowadays think about the problem. Thus, at least in my view, van Inwagen's an essay on free will and his thinking about free will are among the most important and fascinating contributions that have ever been made in the field. At the heart of von Inwagen's thinking about free will lies his repeated insistence on the fact that free will is a mystery. He describes his position as follows. I quote, and we have already heard that, free will is a mystery because there are good arguments for the incompatibility of free will and determinism and good arguments for the incompatibility of free will and indeterminism. And no one has ever identified a very plausible candidate for the flaw in any of the arguments in either class. Van Inwagen, of course, believes that the argument he has given for the incompatibility of free will and determinism contain no flaws. That's still the quote um, 
and that there is some flaw or are some flaws in the familiar arguments for the incompatibility of free will and indeterminism. But as to the latter class of arguments, well, he's damned if he knows what the flaws in them might be. He simply hasn't a, quote, uh, hasn't a clue, end quote. In van Inwagen's view, free will is a mystery because, this is another quote, the following is certainly the case. Some proposition, or maybe there is more than one, about matters relating to free will, determinism, and moral responsibility that seems to us to be obviously true is false. End quote. In what follows, I will hint at what, in my view, might be a flaw in van Inwagen's arguments for the incompatibility of free will and determinism. According to van Inwagen, nobody is able to do anything about the truth of a complete description of a past state of the world. In my view, this is a proposition about matters relating to free will, determinism, and moral responsibility that might well be false, even though it seems to us to be obviously true. However, I will not argue directly against this proposition. Instead, I will only argue that van Inwagen has given us no reason to believe that this proposition is true. To this end, I will develop, though not endorse, three arguments that, if successful, will show that van Inwagen's attempt to argue for this proposition fails. I will argue that van Inwagen's attempt to argue for this proposition is first, incompatible with a theory of propositions according to which necessarily equivalent propositions are identical, second, incompatible with a description theory of proper names according to which proper names are merely abbreviations for definite descriptions, and third, incompatible with a metaphysical theory according to which there is no such thing as the past. At the end of my talk, I sketch an independent argument to the conclusion that von Inwang's attempt to justify his crucial assumption fails. I will conclude that there is reason to think that von Inwagen has given us no reason to believe that nobody is able to do anything about a complete description of a past state of the world. As a corollary, I will show that my arguments do not only apply to von Inwagen's argument for the incompatibility of free will and determinism, but also to a famous argument for the incompatibility of free will and divine foreknowledge. I thought this parallel is instructive in many ways, and so I decided to extend my argument. Okay, so, I, so now I come to the second point, Peter van Inwagen's consequent argument. You can find that on the handout. To start with, it might be helpful to recapitulate the main idea of van Inwagen's consequence argument. To make a long story short, let us say that our truth is untouchable just in case that nobody is or ever has been able to do anything about its truth. If we let P0 be a proposition that expresses the state of the world in the remote past, and if we let L be the conjunction of all laws of nature, then the main idea of his argument seems to be the following. Suppose, for example, that it is true that Epimenides will tell a lie at the meeting of the assembly. If determinism is true, the proposition that Epimenides will tell a lie at the meeting of the assembly follows from, from the conjunction of P0 and L. But nobody is able to do anything about P0, for nobody is able to do anything about a description of the past, and nobody is able to do anything about L, for nobody is able to do anything about the laws of nature. It follows that if determinism is true, nobody is able to do anything about the fact that Epimenides will tell a lie at the meeting of the assembly. As is well known, one might construct a parallel argument for the incompatibility of free will and divine foreknowledge. And it is not surprising in this respect that van Inwagen not only defends the view that free will and determinism are incompatible, but also the view that free will and divine foreknowledge are incompatible. Four, consider again the proposition that Epimenides will tell a lie at the meeting of the assembly. If we let P0 be the proposition that God believed long before the existence of the first human being, that Epimenides will tell a lie at the meeting of the assembly, then the main idea of the argument seems to be the following. Suppose, again, that it is true that Epimenides will tell a lie at the meeting of the assembly. If so, the proposition that Epimenides will tell a lie at the meeting of the assembly follows from P0. But nobody is able to do anything about P0, for nobody is able to do anything about a description of the past. It follows that nobody, not even Epimenides, is able to do anything about the fact that Epimenides will tell a lie at the meeting of the assembly. 
So that was just to recapitulate the argument. So now I come to the third point, the fixity of descriptions of the past. In what follows, I will identify what, in my view, might be a flaw in both arguments. I will try to show that van Inwagen's attempt to justify the assumption that P0 is an untouchable truth fails, and that he has therefore given us no reason to believe that P0 is an untouchable truth. Yeah, and besides that, I will show that my reasoning applies not only to van Inwagen's argument for the incompatibility of free will and determinism, but also to the argument for the incompatibility of free will and divine foreknowledge. So now I come to 3.1, um, how van Inwagen justifies his assumption, and there you can find the quote. Here, at any rate, is van Inwagen's attempt to justify this assumption. Quote, P0 is obviously an untouchable truth. P0 is an untouchable truth for the same reason that dinosaurs once walked the earth is an untouchable truth. Both are truths about the past and indeed truths about the pre-human past. End quote. Elsewhere, van Inwagen holds that, quote, no agent is able to render false a true proposition about the past, end quote. Before I explain why I have doubts about this argument, I will first try to reconstruct van Inwagen's reasoning. At first glance, he might appear to argue as follows. And you find all the reconstructions on the handout. So the first reconstruction, P0 is a true proposition about the past, Second premise, every true proposition about the past is an untouchable truth, therefore P0 is an untouchable truth. However, it is simply not true that every true proposition about the past is an untouchable truth. For, as is well known from debates about free will and divine foreknowledge, there are propositions about the past that are not entirely about the past. Take, for example, the proposition that yesterday I smoked for the last time. Without doubt, this is a proposition about the past. It says something about the past, namely that yesterday I smoked. Nonetheless, this proposition is not entirely about the past, for it says something about the future as well, namely that I will never smoke again. And now suppose that yesterday I in fact smoked for the last time. The proposition that yesterday I smoked for the last time then appears to be a true proposition about the past that is not an untouchable truth. For even if I will never smoke again, I am without doubt able to smoke again, and I am therefore able to do something about the fact that yesterday I smoked for the last time. I conclude that not every true proposition about the past is an untouchable truth. We should therefore modify von Inwagen's argument as follows. This is the second reconstruction, and you can find that on the handout. First premise, P0 is a true proposition entirely about the past. Second premise, every true proposition entirely about the past is an untouchable truth. Therefore, P0 is an untouchable truth. However, this argument is equally bound to fail. For it is simply not true that every true proposition entirely about the past is not an untouchable truth. To see why, recall that, according to van Inwagen, a truth is untouchable just in case that nobody is or ever has been able to do anything about its truth. Now, just to mention one example, consider the proposition that Caesar crossed the Rubicon. This is a true proposition entirely about the past that is not an untouchable truth. For even though nobody is now able to do anything about it, somebody certainly has been able to do something about it, presumably Caesar. Thus, not just any true proposition entirely about the past turns out to be an untouchable truth. For this reason, we should come up with a different reconstruction of van Inwagen's argument. We should, as van Inwagen himself suggests in the quotation above, argue that P0 is an untouchable truth because P0 is a true proposition entirely about the pre-human past. This leads to a third reconstruction of van Inwagen's argument. First premise, P0 is a true proposition entirely about the pre-human past. Second premise, Every, every true proposition entirely about the pre-human past is an untouchable truth. Um, hence, P0 is an untouchable truth. Note, however, that von Inwagen's argument has a premise that, after careful reflection, might seem far from obvious. The premise that P0 is a true proposition entirely about the past, that is, a proposition that is not even in part about the present or the future. As will soon emerge, there are 
there are a couple of reasons to reject this assumption. Now I come to 3.2, why van Inwang's attempt to justify his assumption might fail. As I said, I will sketch, sketch three arguments to the conclusion that P0 is not a true proposition entirely about the past. For if P0 is not a true proposition entirely about the past, then it seems that van Inwang has given us no reason to suppose that P0 is an untouchable truth. However, given that a full defense of these arguments is impossible within the bounds of this talk, and given that I'm not sure whether I want to commit myself to all premises of these arguments, even though a lot speaks in favor of them, I have decided to present my arguments in an unusual way. I will present my arguments in the form of a list of advices for compatibilists. So now I come to 3.2.1, identity of necessarily equivalent propositions. Here is my first advice for compatibilists. Defend a theory of propositions according to which necessarily equivalent propositions are identical. For example, David Lewis's or Robert Stalnaker's theory of proposition. For, as I will argue, every true proposition is at least in part about the future if necessarily equivalent propositions are identical. And it is obvious that no true proposition is entirely about the past if every true proposition is at least in part about the future. Therefore, no true proposition is entirely about the past if necessarily equivalent propositions are identical. I have listed uh, the, the main principles on the handout that are crucial for the argument. To see why this is so, suppose that necessarily equivalent propositions are identical. It straightforwardly follows that necessarily equivalent propositions are about the same time. Thus, if P is at least in part about time T, and if P is necessarily equivalent to Q, then Q is also at least in part about time T. Take, for example, the proposition that Napoleon lost the Battle of Waterloo, and take further the necessarily equivalent proposition that Napoleon lost the Battle of Waterloo and 2 plus 2 equals 4. According to the equivalence principle, the latter proposition is about 1815 if the former is, and vice versa. Further, it is plausible to assume, this is the conjunction principle, it is plausible to assume that a conjunction is at least in part about time t if it has a conjunct that is at least in part about time t. Take, for example, the proposition that Newton invented the calculus in 1676 and Leibniz invented the calculus in 1675. According to the conjunction principle, this proposition is about 1675 if it has a conjunct that is about 1675. Finally, take the proposition that either there will be a sea battle tomorrow or there will not be a sea battle tomorrow. This proposition appears to be a necessary truth that is, that is at least in part about the future. Now, and now I come to the main argument, and you can read that argument on the handout. Let P be an arbitrary truth, and let Q be the proposition that either there will be a sea battle tomorrow or there will not be a sea battle tomorrow. P entails Q, given that Q is a necessary truth. Thus, given that P entails Q, P is equivalent to the conjunction of P and Q. That is, P is equivalent to a proposition that has Q as a conjunct. However, Q is at least in part about the future. Thus, P is equivalent to a proposition that has a conjunct that is at least in part about the future. It follows from the conjunction principle that P is equivalent to a proposition that is itself at least in part about the future. And it follows further from the equivalence principle that P is itself at least in part about the future. But without doubt, no proposition that is itself at least in part about the future is entirely about the past. Therefore, P is not entirely about the past. It follows that no true proposition is entirely about the past, given that P is an arbitrary truth. I conclude that no true proposition is entirely about the past if necessarily equivalent propositions are identical. So let us take a step back. According to van Inwang's argument for the incompatibility of free will and determinism, and according to a parallel argument for the incompatibility of free will and divine foreknowledge, P0 is an untouchable truth. As we have seen, it is highly plausible to assume that P0 is an untouchable truth, if P0 is a true proposition entirely about the pre-human past. However, as we have also seen, there are no true propositions entirely about the pre-human past, 
if necessarily equivalent propositions are identical. Thus, if necessarily equivalent propositions are identical, there appears to be no reason to believe that P0 is an untouchable truth. Now I come to 3.2.2, descriptivism about proper names. Here is my second advice for compatibilists. Defend a description theory of proper names according to which sentences like Saul Kripke gave a famous lecture at the University of Princeton and sentences like the author of Naming and Necessity gave a famous lecture at the University of Princeton express the same proposition. For example, Bertrand Russell's or Elvin Plantinga's theory of proper names. The main idea of a description theory of proper names is that proper names, such as Saul Kripke, are merely abbreviations for definite descriptions, such as the author of Naming and Necessity. As I will argue, it follows from this idea that P0 is about everything. And P0 is certainly not entirely about the past if P0 is about everything. To see why a description theory of proper names entails that P0 is not entirely about the past, recall that P0 is a proposition that expresses the state of the world at a time long before the existence of the first human being. Let T0 denote that time, and let us suppose that at T0 there is a dinosaur that walks the earth. Let us call that dinosaur Rex. Now consider the following example. Suppose that I'm walking through a forest and I see a stone. I am, of course, able to touch this stone, but I don't. Suppose that if I were to touch this stone, I would come in contact with a very old subatomic particle, a subatomic particle that has existed ever since dinosaurs walked the earth. Let us call this subatomic particle Tony. And let us suppose that Rex, the dinosaur, is the only living being that has ever come in contact with Tony. Now consider the following sentence. The only living being that has ever come in contact with Tony walked the earth at T0. At first glance, this sentence might appear to express a true proposition that is entirely about the pre-human past. For given that Rex is the only living being that has ever come in contact with Tony, it says something about what happened in the pre-human past. On the other hand, this statement is certainly not an untouchable truth. For, as has been supposed, I am able to touch that stone, and if I were to touch that stone, I would come in contact with Tony. Thus, if I were to touch that stone, it would be false that the only living being that has ever come in contact with Tony walked the earth at T0. For it would then be false that there is only one living being that has ever come in contact with Tony. Therefore, I am able to do something about the fact that the only living being that has ever come in contact with Tony walked the earth at T0. I conclude that this sentence appears to express a proposition that is entirely about the pre-human past, even though it is not an untouchable truth. So, in my view, this does not constitute a counterexample to van Inwag's view that every true proposition entirely about the pre-human past is an untouchable truth. You recall this is um, the second premise of his argument. This example does not constitute a counterexample to van Inwag's view because this sentence does not express a proposition that is entirely about the past. To see this, note that this sentence contains a definite description the only living being that has ever come in contact with Tony, and that it therefore appears to express the same proposition as the following sentence. There is something that walked the earth at T0, and that is such that everything is identical with it, if and only if it is a living being that has ever come in contact with Tony. The proposition expressed by this sentence, however, appears to be about everything. Thus, in my view, sentences that contain definite descriptions do not constitute a counterexample to von Inwang's view that every true proposition entirely about the premium past is an untouchable truth. If you don't agree with me, if you don't have the intuition that this proposition is um, about everything, so much the worse for van Inwang's argument, because then we have here a direct counterexample against the second premise. But... I don't think so. I think if we have sentences that contain definite descriptions, these uh, sentences express propositions that are about everything. Note, however, that van Inwagen is now faced with a di dilemma. This is um, the main argument of this part, and you can find that argument on the handout, so you can read it. 
For according to a description theory of proper names, the proper name Rex is merely an abbreviation for a definite description. Suppose, for example, that Rex is merely an abbreviation for the only living being that has ever come in contact with Tony. <coughs> Accordingly, the sentence Rex walked the earth at T0 and the sentence the only living being that has ever come in contact with Tony walked the earth at T0 express the same proposition. However, the latter sentence contains a definite description and appears, therefore, to express a proposition that is about everything. Therefore, given that the latter sentence expresses the same proposition as the former sentence, the former sentence appears to express a proposition that is about everything. Now, recall that according to van Inwagen, P0 is a true proposition that expresses the state of the world at T0, or as van Inwagen puts it elsewhere, a true proposition. That quote gives a complete description of the state of the world at T0, end quote. Recall further that Rex walked the earth at T0. Now, either the proposition that Rex walked the earth at T0 is a conjunct of P0 or not. If the proposition that Rex walked the earth at T0 is not a conjunct of P0, then P0 does not appear to be a complete description of the state of the world at T0, contrary to our assumptions. If, on the other hand, the, the proposition that Rex walked the earth at T0 is a conjunct of P0, then P0 has a conjunct that is about everything. It follows that P0 is itself about everything, and P0 is certainly not entirely about the past if P0 is about everything. In the case of the argument for the incompatibility of free will and divine foreknowledge, things get even worse. To see this, let P be the proposition that there will be a fool who says in his heart that the ontological argument is a failure, and let P0 be the proposition that God believed long before the existence of the first human being that there will be such a fool. According to a description theory of proper names, the proper name God is merely an abbreviation for a definite description. Suppose, for example, that God is merely an abbreviation for that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Accordingly, the sentence God believed that there will be such a fool and the sentence that than which nothing greater can be conceived believed that there will be such a fool express the same proposition. However, the latter sentence contains a definite description and appears to express a proposition that is about everything. Therefore, given that the latter sentence expresses the same proposition as the former sentence, and given that the former sentence expresses P0, it follows that P0 is about everything. It is obvious, however, that no true proposition that is about everything is entirely about the past. Thus, it follows from the main idea of a description theory of proper names that P0 is not entirely about the past. Okay, I skip a little bit and I come to... 3.2.3, deflationism about the past. So far, I have argued as if I had an intuitive grasp of phrases like being about the past or being entirely about the past. In my view, these phrases are perfectly legitimate as long as it is clear that we are expressing ourselves only carelessly or loosely. However, if we want to express ourselves strictly or metaphysically, we are not, as it were, entitled to take these phrases for granted. From now on, I will do my best to express myself strictly, and I will therefore question the legitimacy of phrases like being about the past or being entirely about the past. The reason why I question the legitimacy of these phrases is that when embedded in certain sentences, these phrases seem to express propositions that imply that there is such a thing as the past. Here, then, is my third advice for compatibilists. Defend a metaphysical theory according to which, strictly speaking, there is no such thing as the past. For if there is no such thing as the past, then there is, strictly speaking, nothing of which it can be truly said that it is about the past. It follows that, strictly speaking, no proposition is about the past or entirely about the past. To be sure, my advice is not to defend a metaphysical theory according to which there are no past things. A deflationist about the past, as I will call an adherent of the view that there is no such thing as the past, might still want to make sense of the view that there are things that once existed but do not exist anymore, or that once were concrete and are not concrete anymore. For example, John F. Kennedy, the Berlin Wall, Gaius Julius Caesar, the Roman Empire, and so on. My advice is only to defend a metaphysical theory according to which there is no one single thing 
that might reasonably call the past. There is no merological sum or collection of all and only past things. No big container, as it were, that contains all and only past things. For, as I said, if there is no such thing as the past, then no proposition is entirely about the past. And if no proposition is entirely about the past, then P0 is not entirely about the past or about the pre-human past. A deflationist about the past, therefore, will simply reject van Inwagen's assumption that P0 is a true proposition entirely about the pre-human past. He will instead try to make sense of van Inwagen's assumption by replacing it with a different, in his view, more promising assumption. It turns out, however, that this is more difficult than one might have expected. So now I, now, now I try to reconstruct Van Inbank's argument such that a deflationist about the past um, um, could possibly um, accept that argument. The following proposal suggests itself. A proposition is entirely about the pre-human past just in case that it is about past things and only about past things, where a thing is a past thing just in case that it existed before there were any human beings but does not exist anymore. Thus, according to this proposal, a deflationist about the past might reconstruct van Inwagen's argument roughly as follows. And you find that this is, I think, the fourth reconstruction of the argument. P0 is a true proposition that is only about things that existed before there were any human beings but do not exist anymore. Every true proposition that is only about things that existed before there were any human beings but do not exist anymore is an untouchable truth. Therefore, P0 is an untouchable truth. The problem with this proposal is that P0 does not seem to be a plausible candidate for a proposition that is only about things that existed before there were any human beings but do not exist anymore. Take as a first step the argument for the incompatibility of free will and divine foreknowledge. It is obvious that P0 is about God. However, it is not true, pays Nietzsche, that God existed before there were any human beings but does not exist anymore. Either God has never existed or he still exists. Hence, P0 is not a proposition that is only about things that existed before there were any human beings but do not exist anymore. Take as a second step van Inwang's argument for the incompatibility of free will and determinism and recall that in his argument P0 is a proposition that expresses the state of the world at a time long before the existence of the first human being. Let T0 be the time and suppose that at T0 dinosaur Rex came in contact with subatomic particle Tony and suppose further that Tony still exists. It seems that Van Inwagen is again faced with a di dilemma. Either P0 is about Tony or not. If P0 is not about Tony, then P0 does not appear to be a complete description of the state of the world at T0, because at that time uh, Tony exists. If, on the other hand, P0 is about Tony, then P0 is not a proposition that is only about things that existed before there were any human beings, but do not exist anymore. For Tony, as has been supposed, still exists. For this reason, a deflationist about the past might prefer a different proposal. A proposition is entirely about the pre-human past, just in case that it is about past things and only about past things, where a thing is a past thing, just in case that it existed before there were any human beings, full stop. That is regardless of whether it still exists or not. This proposal leads roughly to the following reconstruction. This is the fifth reconstruction on the handout. First premise, P0 is a true proposition that is only about things that existed before there were any human beings. Second premise, every true proposition that is only about things that existed before there were any human beings is an untouchable truth. Therefore, P0 is an untouchable truth. Admittedly, it is not always clear whether a proposition is only about things that existed before there were any human beings. There are, however, strong reasons to doubt that every true proposition that is only about things that existed before there were any human beings is an untouchable truth. So there is reason to doubt the second premise this time. Take, for example, the proposition that subatomic particle Tony will live for another thousands of years. If there are any propositions that are only about things that existed before there were any human beings, 
this proposition appears to be a plausible candidate, for this proposition appears to be only about a subatomic particle that existed before there were any human beings. Suppose, however, that poor old Tony has been captured by crazy scientists of the Large Hadron Collider, and suppose further that one of these scientists is able to do something that might destroy poor old Tony. Um, if so, even if Tony will in fact live for another thousands of years, it is not an untouchable truth that Tony will live for another thousands of years. For there is someone who is able to do something about the fact that Tony will live for another thousands of years. So I conclude that um, the second premise, or there's reason to think that the second premise is false. In general, I conclude that it is more difficult than expected to make sense of an Invang's argument, as, at least if there is no su such thing as the past. Um, however, I hope that our reflections about the past will lay the ground for a further argument that is n acceptable even, f even for those who believe that there is such a thing as the past. So if you thought all the time, well, I, I believe there is a big container that contains all and only past things, so that last argument is for you. <laughs> um, and you find uh, the whole argument on the handout. For a past thing, as we have seen, may be either a thing that once existed but does not exist anymore, or, on the other hand, a thing that once existed, regardless of whether it still exists or not. So, in general, van Inwagen appears to face the following dilemma. That's the main argument of that part. Either things that once existed and still exist are, if I may so express myself, part of the past or not. If things that once existed and still exist are not part of the past, then there is reason to think that P0 is either not a complete description of the past state of the world or not entirely about the past. For either P0 is about things that once existed and still exist or not. If P0 is not about things that once existed and still exist, then P0 is not a complete description of a past state of the world. If, on the other hand, P0 is about things that once existed and still exist, then P0 is not entirely about the past, for then P0 is about things that are not part of the past. If, on the other hand, things that once existed and still exist are part of the past, then, again, there is reason to doubt that every true proposition entirely about the past is an untouchable truth. For then there are true propositions that are entirely about the past, even though they are about things that still exist. And if there are true propositions entirely about the past that are about things that still exist, then there is no reason to think that every true proposition entirely about the past is only about things that are beyond our control, because these things still exist. Either way, van Inwang's argument for his assumption that P0 is an untouchable truth fails. He has given us no reason, or at least there is reason to think that he has given us no reason to believe that P0 is an untouchable truth. So, by way of conclusion, according to Van Inwagen, free will, quote, is a mystery because there are good arguments for the incompatibility of free will and determinism, and good arguments for the incompatibility of free will and indeterminism, and no one has ever identified a very plausible candidate for the flaw in any of the arguments in either class, end quote. He concludes that some proposition, quote, about matters relating to free will, determinism, moral responsibility, that seems to us to be obviously true, is false, end quote. In my talk, I have tried to identify a flaw in von Inwagen's argument, or what, uh, something that might be a flaw. For, as we have seen, the only reason to believe that P0 is an untouchable truth is the assumption that P0 is a true proposition entirely about the past. That's the only reason we have to assume that uh, this proposition is untouchable. However, as we have also seen, there are a couple of reasons to doubt the assumption that P0 is a true proposition entirely about the past. I have argued that P0 is not a true proposition entirely about the past. If necessarily equivalent propositions are identical, if proper names are abbreviations for definite descriptions, and if there is no su such thing as the past. Finally, I have argued that there are independent reasons to think that a description of a past state of the world, like P0, is either not untouchable or only complete if not entirely about the past. That is, I have argued that there are independent reasons to think that P0 is either not untouchable or not entirely about the past. 
And as a corollary, I've shown that pretty much the same reasoning applies to famous argument for the incompatibility of free will and divine foreknowledge. Thank you.